with uh, enrollment projections overview and Dr. Noonan and Ms. Michael, I assume you are. I, I'm going to just say a quick, um, a quick thing and then I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Michael because I, I did want to echo sort of your sentiment there is that, you know, normal, the normal business of the board um, and the school division does go on uh, in the context of a pandemic. And this is the time of year where we continue to look or begin to look at our enrollment projections and the overview for the coming year um, as we begin to think about what the budget's going to look like uh, as we head into the December meeting, uh, that's the joint meeting with the city council. So, um, so tonight, um, Ms. Michael's going to roll through the en enrollment overview and projections um, to give you a sense of where we are. And as you may recall, um, in the uh, previous conversation, there were three different methodologies to look at with respect to um, an, an enrollment overview, and um, we we think we've selected one. <laughs> so. With that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Ms. Michael. Thank you so much for the opportunity to discuss our enrollment projections this year from Weldon Cooper. So we wanted to start the process this year by kind of going over our current year enrollment. And if I look at that, it's very, very small on the screen. Um, when we look at this chart, this chart shows our actual enrollment for fiscal year 17, 18, 19, and 20. Right, those columns are listed. Then we have what the change was to the projection for 2021. What was the projection from Weldon Cooper for this current school year, 2021? Then in the second to the right column, what was our enrollment as of September 30th? And then what was the variation with the projection? So if we look at the top line on the chart, it's kindergarten. If we look back to 2017, our actual was 191. Right. If we look at where we were at last year, so in 2020, we had 181 students in kindergarten. Our projection was a decrease of 13, so we were projecting 168 kindergarten students. Our kindergarten enrollment as of September 30th was 132, so we had 36 fewer kindergarten students than we projected. So when you look at that chart overall, when we look at through K to 12, um, our actual student enrollment was 165 students lower than we projected. And when we add Jesse Factory Preschool, overall, we were at 182 students currently, um, fewer than we have projected for this year. So when you look at that, this is a, a graphic chart that kind of shows where that variance is. And visually, this lets you easily see that the biggest gap between our projected and our actual enrollment occurred at kindergarten and grade nine. So kindergarten is, is definitely been one of our harder years to project. And typically when we look at ninth grade, we see more students enrolled than we had in eighth grade. We tend to see students coming into our system, right? So in both of these cases, the places we have that largest gap are typically where we have students coming into the system. So it's hard to assess um, where they're at. Um, but we'll talk in a little bit about enrollment across the state is, is lower um, than most schools had projected. So historically, when we look at our enrollment over time, this graph goes back to 2001, 2002 on the left. And it shows the enrollment each year. And there's a different color for each grade level. So pre-K is the color that's at the very bottom of each chart. And 12th grade is the top color at each chart. And this is a great visual way to just look at how that enrollment has changed over the years to, to see the mixture of students. And then it also lets you see that our enrollment was kind of rising and rising and rising. It had gotten a little bit flat since 2016 and how you can see our current year is um, lower um, than many of the pre preceding years. So I want to talk a little bit about our special populations for this current year before we go into the projections. These are new charts that we hope um, the board and the public will find really helpful. So this is English for speakers of other languages. Again, we have that multiple years data. So 2016, 17, 2018, 19, moving all the way through to the current year of 2021. And then the very last column shows the change from this year to the last year. Then this chart is also divided into three categories. The first group are students that are receiving ESOL services. The second part of the um, chart is students that are exiting ESOL. They've finished receiving their ESOL services. Some of you may have also heard these students in the past being called bridging, right? They're bridging out of ESOL. 
And then at the very bottom of the chart, we also do have some families that decline or refuse service. So they're down there at the bottom. So the number that we look at most frequently in terms of budgeting and planning and staffing is that number receiving services. And you can see that our current number of students this school year receiving services is 115. And that is a decrease of 33 students as compared to the prior year. When we look at our other groups of students receiving services, this chart shows our students that are economically disadvantaged. We currently have 200, which is just five below the number we had last year. Students with disabilities are 322 as compared to 333 the prior year. And then the next two columns are students that are homeschooled and have religious exemptions. And you can see that those numbers typically were somewhere in the mid 20s. Um, last year we had 23 students and this year that number increased to 69. So when we look at our 2020 projections and the factors that are influencing those, um, Weldon Cooper, the thing that is significantly impacting them right now are birth rates. So the projections that they did this year for birth rates, instead of just using Falls Church City, they used births from Falls Church, as well as Alexandria, Arlington, Fairfax, and Fairfax City. They said that when they looked at the data earlier this decade, just using Falls Church births, um, was slightly more accurate in predicting kindergarten. But when they looked at the last five years, they realized that looking at births from those surrounding jurisdictions would have been a much better projector in terms of our kindergarten. So they made that change in these upcoming projections. And then just another note, overall births in Virginia um, have declined in the last couple of years. So just kind of taking that into account as well. Then they also noted we spent Michelle Cop um, was super helpful in this process. We spent a fair amount of time talking with Weldon Cooper this year um, as we sent them our data, really trying to ensure that we were getting the best value from our projection process and they understood our jurisdiction really well. Um, and, and I think they do. And one of the things they talked about is given the relatively small size of Falls Church, that new home construction really can impact our projections. Um, so we've been working with the um, assessor and really trying to see if we can get a better handle on how to project future changes in housing, because we also know that that will have an impact, but it's not factored into these projections. So as a reminder, the enrollment projection process, each fall we send our September 30th enrollment to the Cooper Center, which is the demographics research group at the University of Virginia. In addition to doing projections for us, they do them for other school divisions. And they also do the allocation that's used to allocate sales tax to all the jurisdictions across the state. When they're projecting our membership, they use birth data is what they're using to project kindergarten. And then they look at our historical and current membership and they use um, a ratio formula to project each individual year's additional students. So the grade progression ratio is how they capture the pattern of how our students move from one grade to the next. And they know that those grade progression ratios can fluctuate. So they use multiple years data when calculating those ratios. And that becomes the basis of their projection. So just a reminder on how they calculate them. They divide the number of students in a particular grade by the number of students that were in the previous grade, the previous school year. So if the ratio is greater than one, right, that means there were more students coming in the school. And if it's smaller than one or less than 100%, more students left the school than came in. So when we look at our current grade progression ratios, I, I think um, this data is really telling and impossible to see way up on the screen in this room. So, so I'll try to talk through it. If we look at 2020 on the bottom line of this chart and our grade progression ratios, you can see that with the exception of fourth grade, eighth grade, 10th, 11th, and 12th, that all of our grade progression ratios are less than 100%. So we had more students leaving than we had coming in. And remember, kindergarten was that birth rate um, ratio, so it's a slightly different methodology. So this really helps you see how our enrollment for this current year is very different from the previous years, right? So for example, looking at the um, first grade, right? Generally, we see more students in Falls Church City join us for first grade than we're here in kindergarten, right? That's been true going back to 2011 
in every year except two, this current year in 2017, for example. Right, and we also talked about we generally see more students who join Falls Church in ninth grade. And you can see those um, grade progression ratios were all over 100%, even 111% last year. Um, but for this current year, we were at 94%. Right, so that really does show you how different the data is this current year. And of course, that is a concern as we look at using this data to do a projection for next year, right? Because the COVID pandemic um, really has impacted enrollment. Um, this chart on the next slide um, is just a graphic um, representation of those grade progression ratios. The nice thing I thought on this chart that Weldon Cooper provided is the kindergarten line is the line in red, and you can clearly see that that has the highest variance um, in terms of, of each year's projections. So when we look at the projections we received for Weldon Cooper for next year, they provided us with three sets of projections, right? Typically what they do is they calculate multiple sets of projections, and then based on their expertise, they send us the one that they believe is the best or the correct pro projections for the next year. So they sent us three and they said that um, they believed that we were in the best place to determine which one of these would be the best. So when we look at all three of these projections, they all show a somewhat similar trend of enrollment decreasing in the short term, but rebounding slightly in the long term. So when we, when we look at number one, um, that progression or projection assumes that all of the students that were projected to enroll this fall don't come back. So the kids who didn't enroll in kindergarten won't be rejoining us in first grade, for example. Projection number two assumes that half of those students will come back. And then projection number three assumes all the students that didn't enroll this year will enroll next year. So perhaps this year they didn't enroll because they're homeschooled, but next year they would come back. So this is the chart that shows what all of those projections are, um, exactly as they came from Weldon Cooper. But what we did is we made another chart that we thought was in some sense slightly easier, but, but maybe not. But I'll walk through it and hopefully it will be helpful. So this chart shows, and these are in reverse order. So projection three is at the top. So you can see kindergarten, the projection was 172 students. First grade 175 and second grade 191 for a total at Mount Daniel of 538 students. When we compare that to our September 30th, that's 40 students more than we currently have in kindergarten, eight students more than we currently have in first grade, and 28 students more than we have in second grade for 76 more students at Mount Daniel next year compared to this year. So that's how that chart works across. So in that projection number three, right, which was where all the kids were coming back, they see our enrollment going up in total by 197 students from, from where we're at right now. So projection two, right, again, you can see that at kindergarten, they're still projecting that 170, but where you see that difference of them projecting only half of the kids would come back, that didn't um, appear in this year's projection is instead of projecting 175 like they did in projection three for first grade, they're projecting 153. And then in that projection number one, where none of those students return, right, they're projecting for first grade 135 students. So we're not gaining back any of the students in projection one, we're gaining back half of the students in projection two or 100% in projection three. So what that does in terms of total enrollment is projection three is up 197 students from current, projection two is up 76 students from current, and then projection number one shows no change in our enrollment from this current year. So the level of pandemic um, impacted enrollment that we're at now is where we would be next year in that projection. So this is just a graphic representation of what those three um, projections look like um, for the next year and then what they look like in the out years. Um, so you can see the projection two and three eventually, or one and two, excuse me, merge together. Um, but projection three, where all of those students come back has a, a higher 
number of students in the far out years. Um, each year we try to include a chart that looks at their projection accuracy. Um, and if you look at for 2021 where we had COVID, um, we were at 92.8% of the projected enrollment enrolled. And that is significantly lower than we've seen in the prior years in terms of projection accuracy. And as I've talked to other jurisdictions um, around us, and as Bass had reported for the state, um, all of the jurisdictions were experiencing a similar change in their enrollment to projections as Falls Church did. Um, Walden Cooper also provides us with long-term projections through 20 or 2035, and these are those charts. Um, this is a long-term projection comparison that we hope is helpful. So when you look at this, the school year is on the far left column. And then the first three columns are the three projection sets that they just gave us for this year. And then following that are the projections we received in the previous years, 19, 18, 17, 16, and 15. <clears throat> so if we look at 2021, um, which is next school year's projection, right? Their projection set one would have us at 2,445 students. Projection two would have us at 2,534. And you keep going across. <clears throat> and you can see that all of those projections for 2021 are lower than the projections they had given us in 19, 18, 17, 16, and 15. So you can see that graphically on this chart. Um, what these, this chart shows is in the three sets of bars on the left. Those are the three projection sets for this year. And each year in the projection is a different color. So you can see how the trend in the projection sets number one, two, and three is really kind of consistent over the long term. And that's really um, consistent with the projections that they gave us in fall of 2019 in terms of the slope and where they think the out years are going. And then you can compare that with where they told us we would be looking back in 2018, 17, and 2016 when they were projecting pretty significant growth in the 2015. Right? I know we had talked previously about how good were the long term projections. So we really hope that this is helpful. So overall, those are all the projections that they've given us. Um, and, and we will continue to use these as we work to develop our budget. I think when we look at the projection sets of either having all of the students come back or none of the students come back, both of those seem pretty unrealistic, right? So that makes projection set two, which has 50% of the students coming back really seeming like the best um, projection that we have at this point. So thank you for the opportunity to present this and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Michael. Um, questions from members? Very interesting. Yes, Dr. Uh, I just wanna make a quick observational comment about the data that we observed tonight, um, because I, I think it's actually um, important to recognize sort of what is happening with the pandemic too. Um, with respect to resource, who has resources and who doesn't. If you look at the number of um, ESOL students and if you look at the number of students that are on free and reduced lunch, those numbers didn't drop um, maybe by one or two students, but our overall division is down 160 plus. So the, the reasonable um, thought is that then who are those students that are going? They're not ESOL, they're not um, students that are on free and reduced lunch, they're students that have have additional resources. And, and so it is a, it is a concern um, to us that we're losing students. And we, we do hope that um, as time goes by, um, we'll be able to, to bring those students back. Um, as we've been tracking the number of students on homeschool, for example, the 69, um, we did uh, in a number of occasions, we did reach out to them all and ask them to come back. Um, to this point, I don't know that anybody has taken us up on that, um, but we did hear as soon as we're fully back open, they are going to return. So we are anxiously awaiting um, some returns for sure. But I thought it was an interesting piece in the data of who who's leaving and who isn't. Um, Thank you, Dr. Noonan. That is, a, that is an interesting observation. Um, all right, uh, questions from anyone on the data? Uh, on the enrollment projections. Mr. Reitinger. Thank you, Chair Anderson.
question. <clears throat> I guess my primary question um, relates to uh, the data that's graphically demonstrated in slide 16. Uh, because, you know, up through around the 2015, 2016 timeframe, we had a significantly rising population over a year. I mean, it was more than linear. Um, and then it started to bounce around and flatten out. And then going forward from here, um, even if you take the, all the students come back, you know, we're roughly stabilizing long-term enrollment projections about where we are right now. Uh, and if not all the students come back, it would be below where we are right now. Um, do we have a sense of what the root cause behind that changeover is? I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure that there are different grade progressions and there are lower birth rates, but I'm trying to get a little bit to, behind that data to understand you know, what's happening in the sense of are there fewer kids or are they moving farther out? I, 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 I really would like to see if it's possible to understand a little bit more about why we're seeing that data. Sure, so what the Weldon Cooper Center staff told us is it's declining birth rates. It's declining birth rates in this region and the state that's really impacting that long-term growth, right? And that could be changed as we look at <clears throat> Founders Row and the West End development and those pieces coming on board. But what's really influencing the projections that they've given us so far for the out years is that declining birth rate. One other, uh question, uh, and I've raised this, I think, once before, um, and I don't know if it's if it makes sense or staff ought to consider it. Um, I would be a little curious to hear what some of our local experts, which is to say realtors, have to say about population trends and people moving into and out of the city to see if there are sort of micro trends around the city that would be useful to understand, in particular, whether some of those things change. You know, I know one of the things that could go into that data, for example, is there's been a lot of, you know, ripping out three bedroom, one bath ramblers and putting in five bedroom, four bath colonials or more. Um, and I, that may be just that all the lots where that's possible has been exhausted. But I, I would think that there could be some local experts that might helpfully inform what we're doing. We may not need that level of detail, but it would be, it might be a useful exercise to ask the question. Yes, it would absolutely be a useful exercise. And we started the projection process this fall <clears throat> with having a really in-depth conversation with Weldon Cooper. <clears throat> and they had actually said, if we can get them the data, right, that they would be willing to take a look at it to really help us try to forecast that. So we were working with the assessor, um, Ryan Davis at the general government to get that data. Um, they had stuff going on and some system issues, but they assured us that they would get us that data and that we could start to use that <clears throat> to really try to analyze um, the impact of those teardowns, how many were left, and really what's happening in each of those kind of development areas. And I, I would just add that prior to the pandemic, we were also um, engaged in a conversation with the general government about looking at potentially splitting the cost of a demographer. Um, because we, we also feel like if we were able to get a demographer and then geocode all of our kids and, and be able to see trends in movement, that that would be very helpful. Thank you, Mr. Reitinger. I'll, I'll just add one piece of info just as a response to your last question. It's six to nine months out of date. So it's, it, it, you take it with that grain of salt. But the last, um, last conversation I had with city staff was that permits for um, houses to be torn down and rebuilt were going at about 20 to 25 a year. And at the pace that they had, they thought, sorry, 50 a year. And at the pace they thought it was something like 20 years remaining. Um, the other piece of information that I got from that conversation is that actually, if you look over the past five years at where the student, the growth in the student population is, the bulk of the growth in the student population in the last five years has been that single family home renovation and a new, a larger family moves into what was a previously smaller student population. So that is a big driver. And I, I, think, you're, I think you're hitting something important to, to touch on. 
And I didn't add that we will be providing the board with that updated count of all the students by the different dwelling types. So that is another um, piece that's in process um, that we'll be providing to you soon as well. Thank you, Ms. Michael. Um, others, other questions? Ms. John, I thought I yeah. saw your hand up, but I wasn't sure. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Chair Anderson. Thank you, Ms. Michael. Um, one question isn't so much about the enrollment projections, but I had a question on, under student services. Do we provide services to homeschooled students? They're listed under student service. I just didn't know if that's just how we categorize those students or. Okay, okay, that's, I just thought that was more of a, okay. Thank you, just for clarification. Um, and Dr. Noonan, I thought that was a really interesting point because um, the point that you made about our um, students who have financial need, uh, because at our last ESOL advisory meeting, which I was actually gonna bring up, we talked about how the ESOL students are often also the students who have financial difficulties, but we've seen that ESOL population drop, but not that economically distant. So I, I didn't even catch it. I thought that was very interesting and definitely needy, in need of a data dive, I think, um, a data dig. Um, and I guess, Ms. Michael, one other question. I know that traditionally these projections never account for, uh, you know, oncoming um, commercial development. Is And that's just, is that how, that's always the case that we don't, in, is it just because it's too far out or that's just too many unknowns or? It's because the methodology that Weldon Cooper uses is, is really purely data driven in terms of looking at bursts and that grade progression ratio. Yeah. And they don't have enough expertise right. in terms of really analyzing all of the different dwelling types when they're coming online. Right. We did as part of the process this year, share all of that with them right, right. in terms of all of that development, really hoping that as we continue to work with them, and work with the general government that we can try to get even more refined projection data. Okay, thank you. But I, I think um, Chair Anderson is correct about the, um, a lot, it seems like the, the enrollment's being driven by these single family homes more so than, than the new developments. But I was just curious. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Downs. Um, other questions from anyone? Ms. Litton. So this is kind of a big picture question, and I know you guys really have no idea, but just as we start to think about assumptions going all the way into next year, I mean, we, you know, there seems to be some good news about a vaccine, but are we making the assumption that we're not still in this at the beginning of next year, or is it just kind of a wait and see? Thing. I mean, I know we all want yeah. to assume that, but I think I, I think, don't think it's a guarantee. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's a hard question to to really answer and to wrestle to the ground. But I do think you know what we're hearing is sort of what the the broader community is hearing too, and that is that the Pfizer trial is done has gone well, and that um, they're looking at getting um, emergency use authorization for the the Pfizer. Um, it's a two shot um, vaccination. They'll be very, and, and in conversations with the Fairfax County Health Department, they've been working on their vaccination plan. Um, there'll be very limited vaccines to begin with, um, but uh, from what I understand from the, um, from the Virginia Health Department and also the CDC, it looks like there would be a much better opportunity for the broader community to get vaccinated in the April, May timeframe. And if that indeed is the case, I think we we're starting we're starting to plan as though we're going to be back next year and and be past some of this. Um, that being said, I, I think just like in any whether it's an economic recovery or a student recovery or an educational recovery, it's not a V shape. You know, it, it may be a V on one side, but it's a gradual curve coming back. And so I think that's sort of driven our decision making with respect to which of the methodologies to look at. Um, but that may that may not come to pass. We may we may actually be in more of a V shape here because we've got the new high school coming online, um, which is going to be very exciting for a lot of people. Um, and and there may be some just other things that are happening in the city that might might bring our kids back. So we, we think it's a cautiously we're, we're, we're moving about this sort of cautiously optimistically, um, thinking that we're going to be back to some semblance of normal um, this time next year. 
but if we're not, we can do online and we can do hybrid and we can do face to face. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions um, from anyone on this? Mr. Webb, I'm looking at your, your screen just to make sure too, so. Okay, Ms. Downs, and then I have one I'll ask. And, I think the, and I missed it. So has there been a decision which of those three are you still working on or we're not ready to reveal or? I, I think we're pretty solid on number two. Okay. Yeah, I think we're going to run up the middle. Okay, on, I, on I mean, this. I think that was what I was thinking as well. It's Unless you all think otherwise. No, I think as long as we don't do three. <laughs> I would that would be I think too risky. So I did have a couple of questions myself. So one is just um, more to get confirmation. Um, looking at the projections, even under the, the largest numbers, we don't have any capacity problems at Mount Daniel under these projections quite clearly. What about uh, TJ? We, we, sort of longer term, I'm, I'm looking out, outbound a bit. And then, the, of course, the high school and, and, uh, and Henderson and different thing, but I'm thinking about TJ. Yeah, I, we're fine with TJ for um, the foreseeable future. And part of that is that um, when, the, when the second grade moved over, it freed up a lot of space inside the building. We've moved fifth grade into the building from the mod. The next question that we really need to wrestle with is what are we going to do with the mod? If we keep the mod, we're good for a, a long, long time. Um, but, but once, once the library moves out, out, we'll have to figure out how we want to utilize that or, or not. And if we don't use it, there's still space for growth. Okay, and then building on that, the next question in my mind is, with the projections being lower at the, for the new high school, we have presumably some extra flexibility in how we could use the building and how we could do teaching and, and other, uh, other uses of that building. So what sort of planning um, do you envision being needed for something like that? It's a, it's a great question and it's a fair question. Um, I, I would say at this point, we haven't really been thinking about what that might look like long-term. Um, to, to, to a great extent, I think there've been some sort of tangential conversations about what would it look like if we needed to move another grade level in there, for example, and then build on the capacity here at Henderson to look at moving a grade level here to free up some space. I think there's those possibilities on the horizon, but not knowing exactly um, what the long-term impact of the high school population is gonna be, because we saw such a dip at ninth grade, and traditionally we see such a spike at ninth grade, it's really hard to know. Um, but, but you are right in terms of there is some flexibility there to do some things differently. Um, when we do open, we expect that we're going to be at about 70% usage capacity. Um, and, and what's interesting about it is um, that there are 70 teaching spaces in that building. Um, and they're all programmed for with the exception of maybe one or two. So they are going to be used. It's just a matter of to what extent throughout the day are they used. So it then becomes a sharing space and, and the like. Okay. Thanks. That's... Um... That's really sort of the questions that I've got. Um, I would, I'm curious what happened to their me methodology in 2019 because that's where the slope break in that graph really kicks in. That, that you see the different projections get a lot flatter right then, but we can deal with that later. That's a, that's a separate point. I'm looking for any last question. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and, and move forward at this point. All right.